talking about your time allocation, I think one of the things you spend an awful lot of time uh, thinking about, I know, uh, is uh, artificial intelligence. It's something that you and I have as a, a shared interest, and it's something that our audience is interested in as well. Um, the question here is a lot of experts in AI don't share the same level of concern that you do about the dangers huh. of AI. Fools. What, what Famous specific, last words. What, speci what specifically do you believe that they don't? Um, well, the biggest issue I see with so-called AI experts is that they, they think they know more than they do. Um, and they think they're smarter than they actually are. Um, in general, we are all much smarter than we think we are, but much less smart, dumber than we think we are, um, by a lot. So, th this, is, this tends to plague, plague smart people. Um, they just can't, they, they define themselves by their intelligence and they, they don't like the idea that a machine could be way smarter than them, so they discount the idea, which is fundamentally flawed. That's the wishful thinking uh, situation. Um, I'm really quite close to, I'm very close to the, to the cutting edge in AI and it scares the hell out of me. Um, it's capable of vastly more than almost anyone knows. And the rate of improvement is exponential. Um, you can see this in things like AlphaGo, which went from, in the span of maybe six to nine months, it went from being unable to beat even a reasonably good Go player to then beating the European world champion who was ranked 600, then beating Lisa Dole, 4-5, um, who had been world champion for many years, then beating the current world champion, then beating everyone while playing simultaneously. Then, uh, then there was Alpha Zero, uh, which crushed Alpha Go 100 to zero. <laughs> and Alpha Zero just learned by playing itself, and it, it can play basically any game that you put the rules in for. If you, whatever rules you give it, it literally read the rules, play the game, and be superhuman for any game. Um, nobody expected that rate of improvement. If you ask those, so, the, those same experts uh, who think AI is not progressing at the rate that I'm saying, I think you will find that their predictions for things like Go and, and other, and, and other uh, AI advancements, have uh, their, their batting average is quite weak. It's not good. Um, the, the, we'll see this also with... Uh, with self-driving. Uh, I think probably by end of next year, self-driving will be, will encompass essentially all modes of driving and be at least 100 to 200% um, safer than a person by the end of next year. We're talking like maybe 18 months from now. Um, uh, NHTSA did a study on, on Tesla's autopilot version one, which is relatively primitive, and found that it was a 45% reduction in highway accidents. And that's despite autopilot one being just version one. Um, version two, I think, will be at least two or three times better. That's the current version that's running right now. Um, so the, the rate of improvement is really dramatic. Uh, we have to figure out some way to ensure that the advent of digital superintelligence is one which is symbiotic with humanity. I think that's the single biggest existential crisis that we face, and the, and the most pressing one. And how do we do that? I mean, if, if we take it that it's inevitable at this point, that some version of AI is coming down the line, how do we, how do we steer through that? Well, I, I'm not normally an advocate of regulation and oversight. I mean, I think one should generally err on the side of minimizing those things. But this is a case where you have a very serious danger to the public. And so therefore, there needs to be a public body that um, has insight and then oversight on to confirm that everyone is uh, developing AI safely. Um, this is extremely important. Um, I think the danger of AI is much greater than the, the, the danger of nuclear warheads by a lot. Um, and nobody would suggest that we allow anyone to just build nuclear warheads if they want. That, that would be insane. And mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. Far. So why do we have no regulatory oversight? This is insane. Well, it's a question you've been asking for a long time. I think it's a question that's come to the forefront over the last year. 
where you begin to realize that it doesn't necessarily, I think if we've, we've all been focused in on the idea of artificial superintelligence, right? Which is clearly a danger, but maybe, you know, a little further out. Um, what's happened over the last year is you've seen artificial, what I've been calling artificial stupidity. You're talking about, you know, algorithmic manipulation of social media. Like we're, we're in it now. It's starting, it's starting to happen. How do we, how do we, is it, what's the intervention at this point? Um, to be honest, I'm not really all that worried about the short-term stuff. Things that are, um, not, like narrow AI is not a species level risk. Um, it, 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 will, it will result in dislocation, uh, in lost jobs and, um, it, you know, the, the sort of better weaponry and that kind of thing. But it is not a fundamental species level risk, uh, whereas uh, digital superintelligence is. Uh, so, it's really all about laying the groundwork to make sure that if, if humanity collectively decides that creating digital superintelligence is the right move, then we should do so very, very carefully. Um, very, very carefully. Um, this is the most important thing that we could possibly do. Yeah. Um, building on that, other, other than AI and the, the other issues that you're, that you're tackling, transportation, energy production, aerospace, what issues should our next generation of leaders be focused on solving? What else is coming down the line? Um, well, I mean, there, there are other things that are on a longer time scale. The, um, and obviously the things that I believe in, like extending life beyond Earth, making life multiplanetary. Um, and I'm a big believer in sort of um, Asimov's foundation series or the principle that you, you really want to, um, you know, I recommend reading the foundation series, but it's like if, if, you, if you know that there's, a, there's likely to be, we don't know, but there's likely to be another Dark Ages, which it seems, my guess is there probably will be at some point. Um, I'm, not, I'm not predicting that we're about to enter dark ages, but that there's some probability that we will, particularly if there's a third world war. Um, then we want to make sure that there's enough of a, of a seed of human civilization somewhere else uh, to bring civilization back um, and perhaps uh, shorten the length of the dark ages. Um, you know, I think that's why it's important that it's important to get a self-sustaining base, um, ideally on Mars, because Mars is far enough away from Earth that a, that um, a war on Earth, the Mars base might survive. It's more likely to survive than a moon base. But I think a moon base and a Mars base, um, that, um, that could perhaps help regenerate life back here on Earth would be really important, and to get that done before a possible World War III. Um, you know, last, last century we had two massive world wars, three if you count the Cold War. I think it's unlikely that we will never have another world war again. Um, there probably will be at some point. Or if we have another one, it'll be the last. Yeah, it, it, it just could be radioactive rubble. You know? um, so, again, I'm not predicting. <laughs> it just seems like, well, if you say given enough time, will it be most likely? Given enough time. This, this is... This is, has been our pattern in the past. Uh, so, um, like I really believe in the zeroth law of Asimov's zeroth law. You know, take the set of actions most likely to support um, humanity in the future. Um, but I think sustainable energy is also obviously really important. That's tautological. If it's not sustainable, it's unsustainable. Yeah, how close are we to solving that problem? Well, I think that the core technologies are, are there with the wind, solar, um, with, with batteries. Um, the, the fundamental problem is that there's an unpriced externality in the cost of, of, of CO2. Um, the, the market economics works very well if things are priced correctly. But when, there's, when things are not priced correctly, um, and something that has, has a real cost, has zero cost, then that's where you get distortions in the market that inhibit the progress of, 
of other technologies. So um, essentially anything that, that produces carbon, it puts, puts carbon into the atmosphere, which includes rockets, by the way, so I'm not excluding rockets from this. Um, there has to be a price. And that, um, you can start off with a low price, uh, but then that price, and, and then depending upon whether that price has any effect on the parts per million, parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, you can adjust that price up or down. Uh, but in the absence of a price, we sort of pretend that digging trillions of tons of, of, of uh, fossil fuels from deep un under the earth and putting it into the atmosphere, we're pretending that that, ha that, that, that has no probability of a bad outcome. And the entire scientific community is saying, obviously, it has, it, it's going to have a bad outcome. Obviously, <laughs> you just, you're changing the chemical constituency of the atmosphere. So, um, so it's really up to people and, and governments to put, to put a price on, on carbon, and, and then automatically the right thing happens. It's, it's really straightforward. Um, what do we do with the carbon that's already up there? I actually think we can manage with the current carbon level, or even a little bit higher. Um, it, it, it's, um, and this is going to sound um, sound like I'm backtracking, but there's actually an argument that more carbon in the atmosphere is is actually good, but up to a point. So. <laughs> We might actually arguably have been a little carbon starved. If you go back 200 years ago um, and say, okay, well, a few hundred years ago, we're like, we had like 280, 290 parts per million of carbon. We're probably a little carbon starved. Now we're about 400, just past 400 mark. I think somewhere in the 400s, probably okay. Uh, we don't have to worry about sequestering carbon or anything like that. But now, if this momentum keeps going and we start going up to 600, 800, 1,000, 1,500. Um, that's where things get really squirrely. Um, and uh, the, the sheer momentum of the world's energy infrastructure is leading us in that direction. Um, it's very, so it's just very important that the, the public and the government's push to, to ensure that the, the correct price of carbon is paid. Um, so that, that will be the thing that, that, that matters. Um, yeah. Our audience is very interested in knowing how many hours of sleep you got last night. Uh, I don't know, about six, uh, five or six, I think. Five? I, don't know. I feel like we know part of the answer to this because you were trapped in Westworld for a while. Um, uh, but, but how, I mean, on a, re a regular day for you, are you, are you, are you sleeping? You're not sleeping a lot, right? Oh, geez, do I look that bad? <laughs> no. Um, you look great. Oh, but thanks. we just imagine with the amount of responsibilities, with the amount of, you know, with, with what you've got going on, do these problems still keep you up at night, or do you think we're on our way to solving them? Well, right now, the only things that are really stressing me out in a big way are AI, obviously. Um, that's like always there. And, uh, and uh, I'm working really hard on Tesla Model 3 production. Um, and uh, we're making good progress, but it's hugely hard work, but those are the two most stressful things in my life right now. Yeah. Um, our audience really wants to know, uh, what do you hope the world will look like for children born today when they're your age? When, sorry? What, what do you hope for the world to look like? What's the best case scenario? Say we solve these problems. What's that world look like? Let's see. So, I think the, a good future would look like, you know, we've we really substantially transferred to sustainable generation and consumption of electricity, um, so that the, the the CO2 risk and the ocean rising risk is mitigated, um, and we're not looking at like you know having Florida and and sort of large portions of the world underwater. <laughs> That'd be great, <laughs> to, to not. Um, but to have addressed that risk, that'd be that'd be enormous. Um, for us to have a base on the moon, base on Mars, to be out there exploring the solar system, start building industry on, essentially, having human civilization go out there, and and and, and have it be such that anyone can go uh, 
the moon or Mars or out to the solar system if they want to make it really affordable. Um, I do think it's important that there's competition, that there are multiple companies doing this, not just SpaceX. Um, and, um, and that AI risk is, that <laughs> I guess it's the sort of a benign AI and that we're able to achieve a symbiosis with that AI. Um, ideally the AI, uh, there's somebody who, I can't remember his name, but had a good suggestion for what the um, optimization of the AI should be, what's its utility function. Um, you have to be careful about this because if you say maximize happiness and the AI concludes that happiness is a function of dopamine and serotonin, so it captures all humans and jacks your brain with large amounts of dopamine and serotonin. <laughs> like, okay, it's not what we meant. <laughs> it sounds pretty good though. <laughs> oh, you'll love it. <laughs> um, well, I like the definition of like, the AI should try to maximize the freedom of action of, of humanity. Um, maximize the freedom of action. Maximize freedom, essentially. Um, I like that definition. Um, but we, we do want a close coupling between collective human intelligence and digital intelligence. Um, and, uh, Neuralink is trying to help in that regard by um, creating a, an interface between, um, a high bandwidth interface between AI and, your, and human brain. Um, yeah, we're already, we're already a, a cyborg in the sense that, uh, that your phone and your computer are kind of an extension of you. Um, just low bandwidth input output. Exactly, it's just low bandwidth, um, particularly output, I mean, two thumbs, basically. Um, so how do we solve that problem? The, the band, bandwidth thing? The bandwidth issue. <laughs> I mean, we've all, we've all succumbed to it now. We're, we're, all, we're all cyborgs. We're just low-efficiency cyborgs. So how do, we, how do we make it better? I think we've got to build, a, we've got to build an interface. Um, like, we didn't evolve to have a communications jack. Um, you know, or, or some... So there's got to be essentially vast numbers of, of, of tiny electrodes uh, that are able to read write from your brain. Of course, you know, security is pretty important in the situation, to say the least. Um, I was going to say, I'm not coming with. I'm keeping my brain air-gapped. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people will choose to do that. Um, but um, it's a bit like Ian Banks' Neural Lace. Mm -hmm. But, not, but in, in the case of Neural Lace, it's sort of, that, that's there from when you're born. Or it, it's sort of, it's not a... It's, it's more a backup. Of a, sorry? It's a backup. Yeah, kind of a backup. Um, this would be... There's, there's a digital extension of you uh, that is an AI, the AI extension of you, uh, a tertiary layer of intelligence. Um, so you've got your limbic system, your cortex, and, and the tertiary layer, which is a digital AI extension of you, and that high bandwidth connection is what um, achieves a tight symbiosis. I, I think that's the best outcome. I, I hope so. If anybody's got better ideas, I'd love to hear it. Um, and... Um, you're talking about another project that you're working on that our audience wants to know a little bit more about, Starlink. Oh. Can um, you tell us anything? Um, do, do you mean Skynet? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not Skynet. It's an internet in the sky. Um, <laughs> um, well, we... Um, we don't talk that much about Starlink, but essentially it's intended to provide low latency, high bandwidth internet connectivity throughout the world. Um, that, there actually will not be enough cognitive processing power on board the satellite system to, to uh, in any way be a Skynet thing. Like it's the <laughs> um, digital AI requires a lot of, super intelligence requires a lot of big servers on the ground. It's too power intensive. Uh, but this is intended to be to provide people with, um, who don't have any internet connectivity with internet connectivity. Um, and it's very good for sparse and sparsely populated and moderate, moderately sparsely populated areas and for giving people in cities uh, um, a choice of, a, a, you know, low cost choice of, of internet access. But I do think it's going to be important, the Starlink system will be important in providing the funding necessary for SpaceX to develop um, interplanetary spacecraft. Um, 
and at the same time, yeah, helping people who have either no or super expensive connectivity and giving people in urban areas more of a competitive choice. Very cool. Um, I have to ask you because it's the number one question. Uh, just going back to Mars, uh, what kind of government do you envision for the first Martian colony? <laughs> Um, so we're and, careful, and, what's your, and what's your title? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> emperor or God Emperor? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> might be too much. I don't know. Um, if, if you have to watch my jokes here. Not everyone gets irony. You know? <laughs> must remember. Must remember. <laughs> um, so I, I think the, the I think most likely the the form of government on Mars would be somewhat of a direct democracy where um, you vote on issues, where, where people vote directly on issues instead of going through representative government. In, in, you know, when the United States was formed, representative government was the only thing that was logistically feasible because people, there's no way, it was no way for people to communicate instantly. Um, a lot of people didn't even have really access to uh, mailboxes or it wasn't even really, a, the post office was very, very primitive. A lot of people couldn't write. Um, so you had to have some form of representative democracy uh, or things just wouldn't work at all. Um, but I think on Mars, most likely it's going to be people, everyone votes on every issue, and that's how it goes. Uh, there are a few things I'd recommend, which is keep laws short. Um, long laws, it's like that's, that's something suspicious is going on if there's long law. <laughs> you know, if, if you're... If the size of the law exceeds the word count of Lord of the Rings, something's <laughs> <laughs> which it does, amazingly, then it's like something's wrong. Um, so there should be a limit to the size of the law that it, you should be able to digest it. Like, how come you can read the Constitution and all of the amendments, like you can read those in maybe an hour? And, and, and we, we govern so much of our civilization by that, and yet modern law is this obtuse, super boring tome that's indecipherable to almost anyone. So I think um, direct democracy, laws, laws that are comprehensible, um, I think having some kind of hysteresis on, like it should be easier to remove a law than create one because things just get to inertia. You have to have something that's going to overcome inertia. So probably I don't know what the right number would be. Maybe it's like 60, 40. Maybe it requires 60% to get a law in place, but any number above 40% can remove a law. Um, otherwise, you just get laws just accumulate over time, accumulate over time, and it, it, it's sort of like Gulliver, where you just get trapped by all these tiny strings and you can't move. Um, you get hardening of the arteries of civilization with, law, with rules and rules and rules and rules. Um, so it should be just easier to get rid of a rule than, than to put one in. Um, maybe they should even have like a, some kind of sunset clause so that they just automatically expire unless there's enough of an impetus to, to keep them around. Um, well, I, know, I know there's a fair amount of interest. I'm interested in he hearing a little bit more about the very early days with Tesla and how it came together. Um, yeah. Your brother Kimball is here. I thought we'd bring him out. Sure. You guys could talk a little bit about it. 